Hey, Pastor Justin here, and I want to welcome you to our verse-by-verse teaching through God's Word. We hope and pray that this is a huge resource to you, and it helps you grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ and the Bible. Also, want to encourage you, if this is your only place where you're being fed, go and be a part of the local church. We love being a part of your life, but it's no substitute for being a part and serving in the local church. Also, if this has blessed you, we would love to hear about it. There's an email that's listed below, and if you send us an email and just tell us how God's Word has changed your life, it would bless us tremendously. Also, would you pray and consider maybe helping us continue this ministry and getting God's Word all over the world? You can do that by going to newheightsohio.com and click on the Giving tab. Anything helps, and we appreciate it. God bless. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to uh, be here and sharing with you all this morning. Um, I'm excited to share with you. We are beginning, uh, we just wrapped up, Pastor Justin wrapped up our study on the book of 1 Peter last week, and now we're jumping right into 2 Peter. And I have to tell you, what you're going to get this morning is just a sliver of really, really good, rich stuff through the book of 2 Peter. I would encourage all of you to, on your own throughout the week, um, get uh, uh, Google some some uh, resources that can help you dig a little bit deeper into the text of Second Peter because it is such good stuff. And to try and give you everything that is in there in one shot would not be doing it justice. So I've worked really hard to try and pull out the main theme that I feel like God wants us to hear this morning. And so you're going to get a picture of that. But we start our new series. Or our, our, our book on uh, Second Peter. Now, First Peter, the main theme of First Peter was how to deal with persecution, um, struggling, uh, hard times out of things that are happening from outside of the church. So, so, so outside elements. Well, Second Peter is a little different. Its main theme is how to deal with things like false teaching and corruption that are actually coming from inside the church. So two be- very big different contrasts there of what is of what's going on. Now, Second Peter, the letter Second Peter was written around, most people believe around 66 AD, about one year before. Peter uh, died. And at this time, Peter is living in Jerusalem. So he is face to face. So he is face with, to face uh, the persecution uh, is happening. The suffering, the suffering, happening, the death, suffering the Christian, the death of the Christians by the hand of the Emperor. Of the emperor and his Nero. first letter, and his first letter, first, first Peter really addressed the situation. Right now, there's no one like that. Right 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 concerning for him. It's not just that suffering that's happening happening from outside of the church. Instead, there is stuff, other things happening that he's seeing, that he's hearing about, things that are happening in the church, teaching that is taking place, ideas that are being given, and even thoughts that are trying to be pushed on others that are completely contrary to what he and the other apostles have been teaching about. And that's really concerning because it's coming from inside of the church. I love the quote by John Stott that said this. It says, the church's greatest troublemakers are not those outside, ouch. They're not those outside who oppose, ridicule, and persecute it, but those inside who try to change the gospel. And so Peter really is basically asking this question. How do we stand firm in a world, in a culture that is, that is full of false teaching and moral corruption? 
And then he spends the next three short chapters of Second Peter, of his letter, to answer that question. How do you do that? And the answer is twofold. And the first part of his answer is this. It starts with Jesus. It starts with Jesus. Now this, this morning, this part is free for you. It's not even in my notes. This is all free. Okay? It's this. No matter what you're facing in life, no matter what you're going through, no matter what relational issues you have going on, trouble at work, trouble at school, whatever it is, whenever you face problems, trials, situations, your first response should be go to Jesus. Because that's the answer, that's the beginning of the answer to all of our problems, to all of the things that's gone. So that was free. Okay, so here's this. So it starts with Jesus, but then it rests on us. The responsibility transfers to us, and it requires our action, our movement. And so this morning, we're talking about your next step. Do me a favor, bow your heads, close your eyes, repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, how many of you have ever played the game or are familiar with the game Hot and Cold? Okay, anybody? Just... A couple, okay, I see a few hands. Well, if you're not familiar, I love that game, by the way. But uh, if you're not familiar with that game, the premise of the game is there is either something hidden or an object picked out. And what you do is there's the person that knows where that is, and they begin to tell you whether you're hot or cold. The closer you get to that object, the warmer or hotter you get. And the thing that I love about the game is its simplicity. Okay, if I take a step to the left and they say cold, I know now not to keep going in that direction. So instead, I'm going to turn and start going over this way. And maybe it's warm, warm. And the closer you get, the, 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 the descriptions change. Warm, warmer, a little warmer than before. Okay, not so hot. But now you're hot. Now you're burning up. You're on fire. Somebody put you out. You know, I love it. I love it because the, the, there is, the closer you get, the hotter you get, the more excitement there is to it, right? The closer you get to it, the more excitement because there's the excitement of I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost to the prize, to the reward, or heck, I just win the game. The, and, and I love that. Now, how many of you got, have gone on long, uh, long driving trips, commuting trips or something, right? Uh, this past August, or really end of July, uh, a year ago, we did that. We moved over here. We packed up one 26-foot truck and a minivan. And we plotted out and we planned our route. It was going to take us five days. We, had, we, we knew what distance we had to travel in a day and what our destination was at the end of the day. And it was a long days of driving. I'll tell you what. Once we got to the last couple hours each day, there was an excitement. You want to know why there's an excitement? Because we knew we were close to our destination. Right? We were close. And I'm, ch I'm chugging along in this 26-foot this moving truck, packed down with all of our belongings. And Lisa's in the minivan with three out of the four kids and two dogs, three cats, and a gold, well, a betta fish. Okay? And, and we're driving along. And this is what happened every single day. Like, we, were, we would be traveling together. And then the last few hours, because of the excitement of being close to the destination, at some different times, I'd see this flash of gray speed right by me. And that was Lisa. And she was, she may have a couple times even put her hand out the window and just waved. But she's like, I'm, I'm going. See, I had a governor on the truck, and so it wouldn't let me get like over 70 miles an hour. And can I just tell you the most disheartening thing is that when we planned our trip, we put in our GPS and it would tell you, you know, you're this many hours from your destination. Well, they weren't giving that with the idea of you could only drive 70 miles an hour. And so I'd start the day, and it's like you're 10 hours from your destination. The closer I got, it was like you're 
10 and a half hours from your destination. I didn't understand it. So you better believe when I knew I was only a couple hundred miles out, I got excited because I was so close. I was so close. Now I'm a part of uh, Dale Ventley and uh, um, is doing this biking group, this small group. Um, it's been so fun to do it. I did it in the summertime, and we're doing it again. Now, when we first, when I first signed up for this biking group, like when you think of men on bikes, we're not just like pulling our bikes out and going for a stroll, you know. Like when you were a kid, you just grab your bike and you go riding. No, I, like first off, I don't even own a bike or a helmet, and so I had to borrow one. I had to borrow, Dale had a second one. So I go and I... I go and he, he gives me this bike to use and I'm like, where are the tires? Like, because they're this, like, I'm like, Dale, they, those tires are going to explode if I sit on this bike. Like, they are so small. And like the seat, I'm like, where's the seat? Like, I engulf it when I sit down. And then they give me this, this helmet and, and like these guys, they're showing up like they've got their riding gear, okay? They've got special clothes that you wear. In fact, I never knew, but now that I know this, I want some because it just sounds like the most comfortable thing whenever you sit down. They have like shorts and pants with padding in them. So that you're like, oh, this feels good. You know, like all of these things, they've got mirrors coming off of their helmets so they can see behind them, these aerodynamic things, like these GPS. And I'm like, I'm just here to ride a bike, okay? And Dale's like, hey, this is going to be great. We're just going to go for a, a, a brisk bike ride to start off, you know. So a brisk bike ride turns into 12 miles, and like, you're like, wow, you went 12 miles. Really, when you're on a bike, you forget how quick you go, but it's still 12 miles. So how we do this is that we ride, uh, we ride out to a halfway point, and then we stop, we do our devotions together, we pray, and then we, we turn around and we go back to where we started. Well, something happens in me once we get to the turnaround point. Like, I just, it, the guys joke about this. They're like, hey, if you want to have a conversation with Enos, you have to have a conversation with him on the first half of the trip. Because I tend to take it easy, you know, we're just strolling. I'm usually in the back of the pack. But then they're like, but once we get that halfway point, if you blink, he's gone. And so what happens, I don't know, something just switches on in me that I get on that bike and because I know, I know that, hey, at the end of this trail, that's the finish line and, and I'm going. So I just put my head down and I just start pedaling and I just go. I don't stop for anybody. In fact, one of the times I went going, uh, I, I went going and I got to the parking lot first before any of the other guys and I waited for like five minutes and they didn't show up and I was like, all right, see you guys. And I got in and I left. And then another time I took off and then I find out Dale crashed and I felt bad because I was like, I just left him out there all by himself. He's like, no, no, it's fine. I'm going in for surgery now, but I'm okay. But it's because, the, man, the closer I got, the more excited I got. I wanted to get there. And, it, and that's so true. You see, you get this, this sense of excitement, this sense of security, even this sense of protection when it comes to closeness. I remember one time Lisa and I, we went to Universal Studios. Somebody had given us tickets for it. And that as we were walking around, they had this, what was called the House of Horrors. Okay, and I'm like, oh, cool, let's go in. And Lisa's like, why would we want to go in? It's like, you know, King Island, King's Island does the haunt thing or whatever. That's basically what it, what it was. I'm like, oh, come on, Lisa, let's go in. It's going to be fun. And so we go in, and literally, you are scared out of your mind. I am like screaming at the top of my lungs, because not because I was afraid I was going to get hurt. I, in fact, I knew what was going to happen. People were going to come out all dressed up, all creepy and scary-like, but you would walk by something that you didn't think was real, and then it would jump out and move, and they'd walk right up to you, like just stuff. And there was this, you just kind of afraid. And so we, we're not very far in this thing, and Lisa sees this exit sign, and she goes, see ya, and she was gone. She left me alone in there. And there's, I don't know if it's just I'm a man, it's my competitive nature. I was like, I'm going to get through this thing. But I am like literally walking around, like, ah, ah, 
what, you know, it's so scared. Well, then this group of like six to seven people walk by, mainly a bunch of girls and then a few guys. And they walk past me and then something gets in my head. I'm like, hey, there's a group. If I can get close enough to them, close enough to them to where I'm not touching them and they don't think, who's this weird guy that's not dressed up as anything following us? Like if I could get close enough, one, I get the protection of the group, but also I've, I've made the employees that are supposed to scare people think because of my closeness to the group that I belong to that group and I'm not off on my own and they'll leave me alone. And so from that point on, all I, I got to see everything that was coming at us. And I made it through that thing. And I was laughing at the girls that were screaming. <laughs> I can't believe you're scared of that, you know. But I, I made it through all because of this idea of closeness. And it's especially more true when it com- becomes, uh, when it has to do with individuals in, in relationships. By far, my most favorite person in the world, my best friend, and I do not say this because I'm going to get brownie points later, but honestly, my favorite person to hang out with, if there was anybody that I would spend the majority of my time and my life with, it is Lisa. She really is my favorite person and I love spending time with her. And the closeness from having that relationship, the closeness of hearing her voice close to me, that closeness of me being able to, to, to reach out and, and touch her and have that closeness and touch and have that closeness of, of her coming back and feeling that, that touch back. There's just, there's nothing like it. You see, closeness connects me to relationship. It, 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 it connects me to relationship. I need it. I desire it. I, I, I really, I, I want it. And all of these examples of closeness show me that closeness requires action. It requires movement. You see, when I'm still in my relationships, I become stagnant. There's no movement to it. There's no closeness because that other person is usually always moving as well. And there becomes this stagnant, that I'm stagnant and there's, there's no more movement anymore in my relationship. And the same thing is true with my relationship with God is that I feel close to God when I'm moving close to God. But when I'm still, when I'm stagnant, I feel further away from him. I don't feel as close. And this leads us to our main point today, that if you remember anything I say, remember this because it is so crucial. It's crucial in two ways. One, that if you truly desire what Jesus promised us in John 10, 10, that he has come that we may have life and have it to the fullest, then we've got to understand this truth. And the, the second the part of this truth is that if we want to stand firm in the face of any circumstance, in the, st- in the face of any trial, we need to understand this. And that is this, is that your closeness to God is determined by your diligence to take next Next steps towards him. Your closeness to God is based on your diligence to take next steps towards him. Now, all of us have experienced some type of, of relationship like this before. That, that we're feeling this, this sharp, cold feeling from a, from a friendship that once was warm and, and, and loving. Or maybe it's, it's that gap that is forming more and more of a distance between yours and your spouse's relationship or the relationship of someone else in your family. What once was, was this feeling of closeness is now this weird awkwardness. And just navigating life by itself is difficult. Then throw in the fact that we've got to deal with people and relationships. That's, that's tough. But put on top of that, this idea of our relationship with God. And if our relationship with God, we have this sense or this feeling like we are, I am very separated. I, it's, that this relationship that I have on them is, is just is cold and distant. Man, it can be debilitating on our life. And so how do we, how do you truly stand firm? 
How do you know what's right, what's wrong, what is truth? The answer is to go to the author of it all. Get close to the one that created everything. Your closeness to God is determined by your diligence to take steps towards him. So, where are we at with Peter? Peter is throwing all caution to the wind here. Okay, remember, he's, he's in the, the last year of his life. He doesn't know how long he has, but he knows. He knows his life is not going to last much longer. And so he wants to leave behind something that matters. Not just another message that was spoken that falls on the ears of the listeners and then is forgotten about, but something that will truly last. And Peter, as he's writing this letter, he's looking at it, he, he's literally, he's laying it all out. Like Peter is in the epicenter of where Christian persecution is happening. He sees it every single day. Men and women of God being tortured and put to death right before him. And so he could hide away the last few years of his life or he could do what he's going to do. And he decides, you know, I'm just going to put it out there because there's things that are going on. There's things ha starting to happen inside of the church. It's one thing for persecution from outside the church to happen, but another thing when people inside the church are actually trying to purposely lead people astray. And so this is a serious thing. So he goes, this is it. And he begins to lay it out. He says, this is how you grow in your faith in order to stand firm and strong to the end. Because he probably saw some friends that he thought, oh, they're going to make it all the way. They're going to stand firm. But then he, he may have seen some of them actually fall and not make it to the end. And so this, is, this sets up what Peter is starting to talk to us about. So let's look at it. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So servant. So servant means uh, slave. It gives this picture, this idea of belonging to somebody, completely belonging to your master. It gives this picture that, that everything that you are, everything that you do and everything that you are about doesn't have anything to do with you with your will, your desires, your ambitions. It's all about the will, desire, purpose, ambitions of your master. But he tells us this. He says, hey, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. He's saying, hey, I belong to Jesus. See, Jesus purchased every single one of us. We belong to him. Now, when we think about this idea of, of a of slave, of having no will or desires or ambitions of our own, it kind of gives off this negative context. But this idea, this idea, when we find the term servant of God in the Bible, it is, it is one of the, the, the forms of the most highest honor that could be given to someone. It's one of the greatest titles to hold. I mean, it's people like the likes of Moses and Joshua, David, Peter, Jude. They all carried the title servant of God. And so Peter was telling, hey, I'm a servant. Every, my entire life is devoted to him, his purpose, his will. And then he goes on. He says, apostle of Jesus. Apostle was just someone chosen by God to help lead the church. Really, the idea of why he put that there is he was giving uh, authority to what he was saying. So when people saw him, they go, oh, yeah, you're, you're one of the apostles. We should listen to what you have to say. But catch what he does. He says, hey, a servant apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. So here he first he goes, you'd think out of, is that out of humility? He's like, oh, hey, I am a servant of God. You know, oh, by the way, also apostle, like pretty, kind of a big deal around here. No, he wasn't doing that for the honor's sake. He was telling you wh what he sees himself at, where his authority is. But then he says, hey, everybody who has obtained this, this faith, see, this faith can't be earned. 
This faith can only be received. It doesn't matter what you do, how much money you give to something, how nice you are. You can't obtain or earn this faith on your own. You receive it. But he's saying once you receive it, you may look at me and go, oh man, that guy, what a man of God. If only one day I could be like that, have the faith like that. Peter says, hey, guess what? Everybody that has this faith, that has obtained this faith, we're of equal standing. He said, your faith is no less than my faith. It's all the same faith. So no longer do you have to feel like we stand on different footings between men and women of God. God looks at us all the same. He has no favorites. What a great thing to know. And he goes on, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That word righteousness just means to be made right. So this this faith that we have, we were made right through Jesus. See, Jesus is perfect. Jesus was perfect. And because he purchased us, we belong to him. As soon as we receive the faith of Jesus or a faith in Jesus, the Bible says that God counts our faith as being made right. Not because it was anything you did. The only thing you did was say yes to Jesus. But it's because of what Jesus did that when you say yes to Jesus, God says, hey, you now have what is his. And I look at you as righteous. You have now been made right. Not by anything that you've done yourself, but only because of my son. Isn't that cool? All right. And this, again, this is all building. Once we get to verse 4, I'm going to tie it all together for you here. All right. So going on to verse 2. It says, may grace and peace. Okay, that word grace means, that word, it it means undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. You can't do anything to get it. You can't do anything to earn it. It's undeserved. Like, that's pretty self-explanatory. But may this undeserved favor and peace, and that word peace It gives us, again, that word peace, it means joined together, bound together, or even, I love love this part, woven together. So it's this idea of bringing it together so that it's secure, that it's it's held on there. And And it gives us this assurance and this confidence. Well, what is this assurance and confidence for? It's, or of, it's, it's for that assuredness and confidence that God loves us and cares for us. And so he's saying, hey, may that undeserved favor, may that peace, that confidence, may it be multiplied. May it be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Now we may see that word knowledge and we think to ourselves, okay, that means I just need to get into my word more and start learning more and more about Jesus. Now I'm not saying you don't do that. Yes, we need to do that, but that is not the knowledge that this is talking about. The Greek word for this talks about, it's not a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge. It's talking about knowing him in your heart. It's an intimate, in fact, the word they use, it signifies the knowledge of knowing someone intimately, uh, that of a husband and wife as they come to know each other intimately in the means of producing offspring. That's a pretty specific, right? Pretty specific type knowledge of intimacy. But what he's saying is it's multiplied through an intimate relationship with Jesus. And it's multiplied more and more the closer we get to Jesus. So it's all about this closeness. It's all about this, this, this intimacy with Jesus that these things are being given to us and it's multiplied. The closer you are to God, the more that grace and that peace you're gonna be confident and assured in. Whereas if you, if you get away from God and you're not feeling as close, the less you're gonna trust some of these other things. Moving on to verse three. It says, his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life. Granted us all things that pertain to life. When we give our life to Jesus, when we truly believe in Jesus, we're a new creation. When we say yes to Jesus, 
it's no longer just God with us, it's God within us. He has given us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. He has equipped us to handle all things that this life has to offer, that the life we just received, we are now able to live fully equipped in the life he just gave us, in the life that we just received. And so that all things, he equips us with everything, with everything that we need. And he goes on, he says that all things that pertain to life and godliness. And godliness just simply means going after God. It's like this, it gives us this picture that we are so conscious of him, that we're so conscious of him that we would live our life in a way that if he were here with us living, our lives would look like his. We would do the things that he did. Basically, it's to be Christ-like. Now think about this for a moment. Think about that, that, that this, this form of godliness is, is it's pursuing Jesus. It's men and women running after God and his will and his desire for their, their life. That is godliness. Now he's equipped us and given us all things. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. Did God just give us the power of the Holy Spirit to just do whatever? No, he gave it, why? Because we are to pursue and live our lives like Jesus did. Jesus didn't come and say, hey, just serve me, bring on all these, no, what did he do? He went out to people. He shared his love with people. He pointed people to the Father. That is what our lives are supposed to look like as we're on mission, that we live our lives in such a way that our lives point people to Jesus. Our lives are not to be passive, but we are to move. We are to have action for it. That's what he equipped us to do. He says, through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. Again, that's word knowledge. So that we know him intimately. Did you know the more time that you spend with somebody, the more characteristics you pick up from that person? There are things before I met Lisa that I had no desire to do. But now that I've been married to Lisa for over 19 years, there are things that she loved to do that I now like to do myself. I used to hate Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> but spending so much time with Lisa and being around her, she rubs off on me in the sense that I am picking up some of the things that she likes, that I have appreciation for those things. One of our favorite times during the year is to put on Hallmark Christmas movies and sit together and watch them. But it is the same, the closer and closer that we get, the more and more I become like Lisa. The same is true for our relationship with Jesus. The closer that we get to Jesus, the more and more we become like him. The more and more of his characteristics and his traits become our own. The more and more our thinking becomes like him and what he saw becomes what we see as we move closer to Jesus. But catch this, catch this, the same is true. Why does Peter keep talking about knowledge? He talks about knowledge over 11 times in three chapters because it's so important. If we stop moving towards Jesus, we become still and stagnant in our relationship. Distance begins to grow because relationships are always moving. But if we stop, God is constantly moving. And what happens when I stop moving towards him? I will begin to be, begin to move backwards to be who I was before Jesus to my life and my practices. And that's why it's so important that we do not stop growing in our faith. We do not stop taking steps towards Jesus. Because when we lose that feeling of closeness, we begin to revert back to who we were before him. And when, catch this, this is so important. When we fall or fail in our life, it's because we stop responding to the Holy Spirit's leading within us. 
It's not because God has moved away or forgotten about us, but it's because we have stopped moving towards him that we no longer recognize the voice of his Holy Spirit living within us. And so we stop taking steps towards him and we stumble and fall, not because he's left us, but because we've stopped moving towards him. Verse four, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. Okay, God's promises are like fertilizer to our faith. They're fertilizer of faith. Man, he gives us, he, faith, faith is the, the foundation of every Christian life. When we receive Jesus, it's, it's because of that faith that allowed us to trust in Jesus in the first place. And then we get this promise. He's like, hey, I'm going to do this. And it's like dumping fertilizer on our faith that we're able to stand strong. So that in times of trouble and confusion and suffering and persecution, we can stand tall and we can go, no, no, no. When the world and everybody else is saying, walk away, do your own thing, we can go, no, I'm hanging on to God's promises. Because his promises are true. And boy, it energizes me to be able to stand before anything and not give up. He says, so that through them, you may, be, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. This divine nature, when we say yes to Jesus, when we know Jesus, guess what he does? He takes the Holy Spirit and puts the Holy Spirit in the heart of every single believer. He puts the Holy Spirit, his divine nature, it's not by our, our will on our own, our power, no. It's by his power that enables. Remember, he says he's given us all things to be able to live this new life that we've just stepped into. But he gives it to us that we, we say yes to Jesus. He puts his Holy Spirit, his divine nature in our heart. The old is gone. The new has come. In Jesus, all things are new. We've escaped death because of Jesus. So verses 1 through 4, really, remember at the beginning I told you our first step, the first thing, the first part of the answer is to go to Jesus. So verses 1 through 4, what, Paul, what Peter is doing is Peter is showing us what God has done. This is God's part of salvation. He's shown us, he's, he's, he's given us the, the blueprint. This is what you do. And when you step into that relationship, you can have confidence. You can be secure in, in, in all of those things. Well, verses 5 through 11, now it goes to us. Remember, the second part of it is we've, we've got to take on responsibility ourselves. We have stuff to do. Now, when we, when we say yes to Jesus, we receive Jesus, that's our ticket into heaven. Like that is our connection to the Father. Now, we could stop there. But this is what Peter is telling us. Listen, there's more. There's more that God has for us. And it requires us to be participants in it. Because if we're not growing close to God and getting closer to God, what happens? We run the risk of stumbling, of falling away when hard times come, when other things come, because we're not holding on to the promise. We don't have that intimate knowledge of Jesus where we're secure and able to go, hey, he's got me, he's got me. All right, so let's look at this. So now Peter is saying, here it is. Here is your part, okay? This is what you now need to do, starting in verse five here. He says this, for this very reason, make every effort, every effort. So he's saying, hey, everything that depends on you, it is up to you. This is your part, okay? God's done his already. Now it's up to you to take those next steps. It says, but make every effort, everything that you have within you, do this. It's up to you to do it. He says, make every effort to supplement your faith. Like I said, that faith is the foundation of all Christian life. Okay, that faith is what allowed us to say yes to Jesus. But what he's saying is to supplement. Other translations say to add or to build upon. So think about the foundation of a house. Hey, it's great to have a solid foundation, but if you never add anything to the foundation or build anything up to the house, you're never going to have four walls or a roof to protect you. You're never going to have heat, electricity, any of those things to, to care for you. 
and you're left out to the elements. Well, the foundation's still great, but hey, there's nothing else there. He's saying, that is the start. That's what gets us in. That's our ticket. That's our relationship with the Heavenly Father. Now, build upon it. Add to it. And so he starts off, but he's saying, he says, add to your faith with virtue. Okay, with virtue. Virtue just simply means moral excellence. Doing what's right all the time. Living your life in the right way. The Greek, in Greek culture, uh, anything that was done in nature, anything in nature that fulfilled its purpose was considered a virtue. So looking that, at that in our context, what is our purpose as Christ followers? Our purpose is to glorify God, to bring honor to God. And so what, what do we do? We live our lives in a way that we honor God. When we fulfill that purpose, we have virtue. And so live your life in the right way. That's what he's talking about. Adding, okay, boom. Okay, I'm gonna start working on that virtue, that moral excellence in my life. And then he says, and then and with virtue, with knowledge. We see that knowledge. We're like, okay, I gotta be in it. No, that's a different Greek word. They're now talking about a learning knowledge, a knowledge that doesn't stop growing. Talking about insight. Okay, awareness, those things. It's, this is where we're saying, hey, get into God's word. Begin to figure out and learn what God's characteristics are, what it is that he's asking us to do and how to live our lives. It's, it's the knowledge that allows us to live and manage our lives. To know what's right, what's wrong. So different type of knowledge. But he says, hey, you, you begin to add those things. The next uh, verse 6, it says this. It says, in knowledge with self-control. Okay, we never want to be ruled or controlled by anything except for the will of God. It's the only thing we should be controlled by. So it takes discipline to do that. I love what Aristotle says. He says this. He says, the unrestrained man does things that he knows to be evil under the influence of passion. Whereas the self-restrained man, knowing that his desires are evil, refuses to follow them on principle. Okay, so there is this essence of, hey, it's going to take us and hard work to do what we're supposed to do. But it's not just all on us. Remember, God enabled us to do all things. He gave us all the tools. He gave us the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome our own flesh and to move forward and to do the things that he's called us to do, to refrain from the things that we need to refrain from. And here's, here is something that's, that's really interesting th that we need to understand. See, God has given us the Holy Spirit and there is power in the Holy Spirit. But God doesn't do this. God doesn't say, oh, for Enos, I'm only giving this much of the Holy Spirit's power. And for Pastor Justin, I'm giving this much of the Holy Spirit's power. That's not what God does. Remember, equal faith. Okay, God gives us his Holy Spirit. There's no up and down switch for the power of the Holy Spirit. The degree in which the Spirit moves in our lives is dictated by our obedience to God. I ask you this question, especially when we look around and we see some people operating in the power of the Holy Spirit like nothing before, and we go, oh man, that's so amazing. If only I had that much power from the Holy Spirit. If only I could do that. And I ask you this, when was the last time you felt God telling you through the Holy Spirit to go pray for somebody? You go, oh, hold on a second. That wasn't me. That was He must not be asking me to do that. And we sometimes do it out of fear. We go, because we're afraid that God's not gonna move in the way we think he should move. And so we decide not to act, not to do what he's called us to do. Most of the time, I truly believe this. I believe that the Holy Spirit has spoke to me on this. Most of the time when God asks us to do something in faith and step out in faith, it's more for us than it is for the other person. It's him asking, will you be obedient to the leading of my Holy Spirit? And I'm telling you, the closer we are to Jesus, the easier it is to say yes every time he asks us to do something. And then before you know it, you're like, 
wow. And somebody goes, man, how much? You, how did you get so much of the power of the Holy Spirit in you? And you're like, I just am saying yes to every time he's asking me to do something. And guess what? You have that ability too. He's given it all. It's up to us to activate it in our lives. He goes on from self-control, steadfastness. Now some translations, instead of steadfastness, it says perseverance. Uh, but one of the best, better translations is that of patience. The idea of patience, and when it's talking about patience, it's referring to, get this, the patience that God has had for all mankind since the fall. Like all God has ever wanted to do is have relationship with you and me, intimate relationship with us. And we screw up his plan all the time. I love, I think about this, my kids, they have a certain set of chores and me and Lisa constantly, our biggest thing that we lose patience, clean the litter box. You know it's your job. You're on a rotation. Okay, it happens every day. But they don't do it until we say, has anybody changed the litter box? Every single day, I lose my patience sometimes. But that is the same with God, but here's the difference. I love what William Barclay says. Patience bears insults and injury without bitterness and without complaint. It is the spirit that can suffer unpleasant people with graciousness and fools without irritation. Well, that counts me out. But that is the patience that God has for us and that's the patience, the steadfastness that Peter is saying build as a quality in your life goes on with steadfastness, add godliness, with godliness. Again, we talked about godliness, but it is, it is doing the right thing because it's for God and because you're looking out for others, that it benefits others. Verse 7, he says, in godliness with brotherly affection. Now, Peter knew all about this. The Greek word for brotherly affection really talks about, the, the meaning of it is that it's, it's like true family, your family members. So treating people around you, your friends, your, your fellow uh, people that you go to church with, Christians, treating them like actual family, like your sons, your daughters, your brothers, your sisters, your, mo your moms, your dads. And Peter knew all about it, man. He, he and the other disciples, they argued all the time about who was the best, who was Jesus' favorite. He's saying, add to it, add to it. And we're going, I, how can I do that? You're right, we can't do it on our own, but God has given us everything we need to be able to do it. And the closer that we get to Jesus, and the more that we build upon these qualities in our life, the easier it's gonna to become to be able to add to more, to more, to more. He goes on in brotherly affection with love. Peter starts it with the foundation and he caps it with love. And the love he's talking about is the Greek word agape, unconditional. There is nothing you can do. You are undeserving. You can't get it. It's like this. It's, it's, it's the love that you share for your newborn child. You've never met them before. I mean, think about this for a minute. Those of you that have had kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They come out and instantly, it's even a different kind of love than what you have for your spouse. Instantly, you're in love with them. You would do anything. You would die for them. And think about it. That's a little silly. Like, they just, nine months, they were like torture to your wife. Like, they're bloated, nauseated. Like, nine months of torture of growing that baby inside. And then when they come out, are they like, Mom, Dad, I love No. They're like, Wah! Wah! Right? And you're like, ah. agape love. That's the love. They didn't do anything. And the older they get, sometimes they're still not deserving of it. But it's unconditional love. Top it off with unconditional. 
unconditional love. He moves on. Now, this is the promise. He says, if you build upon all these qualities, he says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, this is what I like to call an if-then promise, even though it says they, okay? But if you do this, then this will happen. It says, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, Again, increasing, it signifies motion. It signifies action. It says they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge, in the closeness, in the intimacy of our Lord Jesus Christ so that you can stand firm. That is the promise. But here's the warning in verse nine. It says, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. Now catch this for a minute. For those believers that are uninterested in growing in their faith. That nearsighted, it gives a picture of this. Purposely closing their eyes and squinting and going, no, sorry, I can't see it. Can't see it. He says that they've forgotten that they were cleansed from their former life. That's the warning. If we stay stagnant, if we stop taking steps, if we say, hey, hey, I've given, I've given years and years of my life, I don't need to do anymore, I, I've arrived, then you run the risk of this warning, of going, no, no, I've lived my life long enough, I've done everything that God's asked me to do. And if we're young, and we are new to the faith, and we step in and we go, hey, I, I did what you told me to do, and then we close our eyes. And we become ineffective. We wonder, why does he talk about the ineffectiveness and the unfruitfulness? It, it matters. Are you ready for this? Verse 10. He says this, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. What he's talking about here, this election. So God has called everybody. God's called everybody. He, Jesus calls everybody through the gospel. Okay, he puts it out there. And those that choose and receive that message, they're elected. They receive that election. This word election, what it talks about in the Greek, it gives, it's this idea of a warranty. So like you buy a house, you get a home warranty. You buy a car, you get a warranty. You buy an appliance, you get a warranty. So that if something goes wrong, you are protected. You are secure in that purchase that was made. That's what it's talking about. That, that you do these things. Be all the more diligent that that choice you made, you become secure in. Why? Because if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Another promise. And here we go, verse 11. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You ready for this? The last probably 13, 14 months have just been huge for me as we've gone through the book of Romans and the book of 1 Peter. Because I feel like that as Christians, we hear all the time about being humble, uh, having humility, all this thing. But then we get on these areas that we're talking about, like, like Paul and, and Peter, they talk about, listen, you do all this, your motivation is your eternal reward, your future glory, that is, that is heaven. And they also says, but you get these rewards, like the things you do, you get these rewards in heaven. And as a Christian, we're like, oh, no, I don't need any of those things. I'm so humble and, you know, filled with humidity, humility that I don't need any of those. It's not about the, yes, it is about the reward. Like it's about the reward. Well, check this out in 1 Corinthians. It says this, if the work survives, the good work for Jesus that you do here on this earth, that the builder, then the builder will receive a reward. They're literally saying, let this be motivation to do what God's called you to do because I got something great for you up in heaven. He says, if it survives, you'll be rewarded. He says, but if the work is burned up, meaning if, it's, if what you're doing doesn't have purpose, if it doesn't have the power of God behind it, you're just like, hey, I gotta be a nice person. I gotta do good things. Well, that's all well and good, but it's not, it's not tied into a purpose. It's not gonna survive because it wasn't done for Jesus. It says, the builder will suffer great loss. Catch this, the builder will be saved. You don't forfeit your eternity. 
you still get into heaven. It says, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. And so what Peter is saying, he said, the, you're gonna be richly blessed. All this, that word there in the Greek, it refers to when an Olympic athlete came home and returned victorious. People were like, yeah, woo, right? They loved it. It's like, it's like when the Bengals returned last year after losing the Super Bowl, they had a parade for them. Like who doesn't wanna be cheered on? Who doesn't want to have their names called out and chant? But guess what? It's saying everybody, everybody that receives Jesus, they're going to enter into heaven. But he's saying, you know what? Some people are going to have a more glorious entrance. And those are the ones that are faithful in doing the work that I've called you to do. Not stopping, not getting tired, not giving up, not falling, but instead continuing the mission of God no matter what comes before you. Why? Because you're continuing to move towards Jesus and you are close to Him. If that is not something to get excited about and know that Jesus and God Himself and all the angels in heaven are gonna be praising and, and hollering for you that what a great job that you did because look at what you did for Him. And what else gets you excited? What else gets you excited? Your closeness to God is determined by your diligence to take next steps towards Him. So how do we wrap this up? You know what? Any of your, any of your earthly investments that you make, your time, your money, your, your energy, your, your resources, all of those, we are never guaranteed a return on any earthly investments that we make. But when it comes to our spiritual growth, we are always guaranteed a return. It's an irrevocable promise of God. Look really quickly at Hebrews chapter six. It says this, for God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. See, also tie this in. Working for God, loving others is working for God. Our motivation, it's, it's, it, it, it's not that whole thing like, oh, it's all about me, it's all about, oh yeah, get it up. But God wants to reward us for the good things we've done. Why? Because the closer we get, the more characteristics of Him we take on, the more we live out our life as He does, the more we see people like He sees people. He moves on, moving on. He says, our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts as long as life lasts, in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Okay, that's the hope of, of, of eternal. Uh, next verse, sorry, that's the hope of, our, of, of heaven. And verse 12 there, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Okay, instead you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. We don't have to worry about our investments and our spiritual growth or wonder if our investment in spiritual growth is gonna, is gonna be worth it. It is worth it. When we build upon that foundation of faith and we build it towards love, we will get a return. Now those qualities, those qualities must be built upon. It's gonna, it, it's gonna take hard work. They need to be nurtured, they need to be developed. And it's, it's gonna take our diligence and hard work to do it, but it is worth it because we are always guaranteed a result. And with God, we can do it. God, it, it's so good. Your closeness to God is determined by your diligence to take steps towards Him. If you've got your connection card, I just want you to pull it out. I wanna draw your attention to my next steps. And there's a, gonna be a graphic here on the screen that's gonna tie into the fourth next step on there. Like I said, it starts with Jesus. Maybe you're in this place today and you would say, I've never, ha I, I haven't began that foundation of faith. I wanna begin that today. It's so simple. It's just Jesus coming to my life. I believe in you. I know you to be true. 
change me, lead me. It's that simple. If you make that decision this morning, would you mark that beginning a new relationship? Maybe you've, you've started that relationship before, but you've, you, ha- you haven't been following through. You've, you feel this distance and you just wanna make a fresh start with Jesus. It's that simple, Jesus, I need you. And begin taking those steps towards him. And then that I will add to the blank quality this week. Here's the graphic. You need to add more faith, moral excellence, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. What is the quality you're gonna work on today? What is your next step to take towards God and build towards the quality that it's gonna help you and your closeness with God? And that if you have not yet signed up for a small group, I'm gonna give you one last opportunity to do so because next week they're gonna be closed down. You don't have to wait until our winter semester. Life change happens. The context of authentic relationship, and that's what small groups help us do. Get plugged in. Jesus, would you move in our hearts? Would you move in our lives? God, we need you like never before. Would you help us to stand? Would you help your word to resonate in our lives? And would you help us? to work on these qualities that you have put into our hearts. We thank you for that in Jesus' name.